Welcome into the show. It is Tuesday morning, and I uh, appreciate you joining on a relatively slow sports day. It'll be a quick show, not a lot to talk about. I want to touch on one thing that I've been meaning to for a couple weeks, but obviously there's been a lot going on, kind of the new format and then things like that, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it, especially with all the soccer, so I want to delve into that. But first, I want to start with tonight's home run derby, uh, which I'm sure you've at least seen highlights or or heard about on Twitter or whatever Vlad Guerrero Jr. although he didn't win it which is really kind of sad um, Pete Alonzo ended up winning which it's just annoying it's I, I don't know if you remember back I can't remember what year it was now but Josh Hamilton in New York uh, was just destroying the ball um, I think he had 28 home runs in the first round, which at that time I believe was a record. But it wasn't even about how many he was hitting. It's about how far he was launching these baseballs. And um, the crowd at Yankee Stadium started chanting his name, you know, Hamilton, Hamilton. And um, that, to me, felt a little bit like tonight because Guerrero was just cranking these homers. But... Pete Alonso ends up winning with considerably fewer overall homers. And that's exactly what happened to Josh Hamilton when Justin Morneau won. So it felt a bit like that, but absolutely incredible performance from Vlad Guerrero Jr. Um, 40 homers in the second round is, is incredible. I'm sorry if there's ambient noise. I just got back to my apartment after six days, and I had obviously had the AC off, and it was hot when I came in here so I've got the window unit I've got the main thing going I, I have to cool this place down <laughs> before I go to bed um, but yeah Vlad Guerrero Jr. 40 home runs in the second round incredible 29 in the first round um, so at that point he had 69 overall sorry so I'm stuck in my teeth <laughs> this is disgusting for television television um Really incredible. Uh, it, it, it is adding some kind of juice, pardon the pun, to this uh, juiced balls discussion that we're kind of going through. Justin Verlander had put it out there that the balls might be juiced, and that's why we've kind of seen this home run surge in the bigs. And I don't doubt it. When you look at last year's home run numbers compared to this year's, they've skyrocketed. Um, and you wonder if kind of MLB is trying to increase the number of, of homers hit increased the offense and, and thus increased the fan enjoyment and fan engagement. It's not out of the, out of the question. I mean, you look back to the Mark McGuire, Sammy Sosa thing, and everybody knew those guys were juicing, but nobody really cared <laughs> because it was bringing so much attention to the game at that time when it kind of needed it. So uh, I, I think they just kind of let it slide. So it wouldn't shock me if they were doing this to the balls now to kind of re-energize uh, fan bases. But yeah, Pete Alonso wins in really disappointing fashion. He can be proud of it, I guess, but I don't know, every time I looked at that trophy, if I were him, you know, I would just think how nobody remembers anything about this home run derby except Vlad Guerrero Jr. <laughs> just cranking out homers. Uh, Pete Alonso's been amazing in the regular season, though, so, you know, he, he's a great player, and I respect him, but, um, you know, this was, this was Vlad's night, and uh, it's kind of sad that, that, that he didn't, he didn't win it in the end. Next up is, I'm going to talk about Jake Marisnik and Jonathan Lucroy. You, we haven't had a real play like this for a few years now. Um, I don't know if you remember back... I'm trying to think who that was, the Marlins guy who uh, injured Buster Posey. Scott something. Scott something. I can't remember. But that I feel like that's the real last controversial play at the plate collision that we've had. And I think that's what kind of put this rule into place that you can't collide with the catcher anymore. You have to slide around. The catcher kind of has to give a path. And that was the thing. Jonathan Lucroy gave a path. 
He absolutely did. He did everything right. He stayed to the inside. I mean, he was on almost the infield grass. Marisnik had an easy place to slide, and he just came barreling into Lucroy. One of the most dirty, dirty plays uh, that I've seen in, in, in a long time. I, I thought it was truly disgusting. You can go uh, to Yadier Molina and, and look at, as people were tweeting out, his responses on Instagram to some people talking about this, and, and they're hilarious. Um, but he's right. He's calling this, you know, a BS play. He's talking about um, how they have to protect catchers, and they do. Catchers already by far the most dangerous position. You just saw Francisco Cervelli is quitting catching because he just got a sixth concussion when a broken bat hit him under the chin. So catchers are already the most dangerous position, and you can't just have guys colliding and running into guys at home plate. To me, Marisnik, this is a 10-20 to 20 game suspension. It's like the targeting rule in football. The first year or two, probably two full years, I felt bad for guys when they targeted because it was kind of a, a, a gray area rule and it was hard to really tell what exactly was going to be called for targeting until you kind of got the idea of it. But then in that third year and, and since, I don't feel bad for guys who target anymore. I sometimes feel bad if the offensive guy like lowers their head and it kind of forces them to. But if it's just a straight targeting, like Donovan Wilson for Texas A&M targeted once a game, <laughs> it felt like, and was just getting kicked out all over the place. And I, I didn't feel bad for him anymore because you know the rule. You've been told repeatedly what the rule is, and it's your job to adjust your game accordingly. Marisnik, with just an absolutely dirty play, he knows the rule. He knows Lucroy was on the inside, and he went straight after him. And I have no sympathy for Marisnik. A 20-game suspension would seem reasonable to me um, because we, you just can't have that in, in, in this modern day with concussion. I mean, uh, concussion and broken nose for Luke Roy, You can't have that. We can't have concussions uh, begin to invade baseball because that's going to be a major, major issue. Concussions are the absolute worst. Uh, we have to protect guys from concussions, especially from entirely unnecessary plays. There was nothing necessary about what Jake Marisnik did. Very disappointed in him, and I think a 20-game uh, suspension is reasonable. Uh, 10 is the minimum I would go with, the absolute minimum. Finally, uh, I, this happened a couple weeks ago, but I haven't had the chance to talk about it. A little college basketball news. Kerry Blackshear Jr. from Virginia Tech, formerly of Virginia Tech, has chosen his transfer destination. Obviously, Buzz Williams left Virginia Tech and Kerry decided to transfer as well. And it came down looking like, looking like uh, Kentucky or Florida. And he has chosen Florida. So Kerry Blackshear is going to the Gators. And, and it, I feel like he kind of fits what I think of when I think of Florida. I don't know why. He just kind of feels like it. But a big get for Mike White. Mike White is obviously trying to, to do the impossible and follow in the footsteps of Billy Donovan. Uh, at Florida, which is, uh, you know, that, that's a monumental Herculean task. But he's doing a good job. He's got a lot of good young recruits. He's obviously got Nimhart at point guard. And now you bring in Kerry Blackshear Jr. with a solid young core. And, and this is a top 10 preseason team, the Florida Gators, to me. Mike White's a terrific coach. And, and I really like the Gators, especially in what should be, you know, a, 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 average SEC. It certainly won't be as good as it was this year. Kentucky's obviously going to be really good. So Kentucky and Florida at the top of that conference should be an absolute blast. Um, and I'm really excited to see it. I think this really puts Florida over the top and gives them a chance at, at the SEC title. I think they're, they're, they have to be right up there in the discussion with Kentucky as we head into college hoop season about who can win the SEC and, and potentially challenge for, for a Final Four and a national title. I think Florida's right in that conversation, especially with the way their freshmen developed towards the end of last year, getting some tournament experience, getting that tournament win under their belt, and now they can focus on, on, on you know getting to that Sweet 16, getting to that next hump, and, and I think that they can do it. I'm excited to watch this Florida team. 
that's all I have for today. Thank you for watching on a Tuesday morning when there's not a lot going on in the world of sports. I hope you have a wonderful day. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when we are live every morning at 6 a.m. So when you're kind of dragging along in the morning, you get that notification bell and you can pop us on while you make your breakfast, take your morning dump, or whatever it is you freaks do in the morning. That's all I've got. Thank you for watching, and I will see y'all tomorrow.